the holiness, the, the, uh, the solemnity, the joy. separation. And of course, when we take that seriously, when, when that aspect of the, the fourth commandment really kind of impresses itself upon us, what we'll find ourselves doing is following after God. Because that's what God did. And we will be entering into God's example and enjoying God's blessing of that day. And as I said just now, all of that uh, might require a discipline if we're not terribly committed, but actually when you are committed, it requires little conscious effort because the desire is in your heart. You want to worship God, you want to devote your time to God, and this is the day that he set aside. This is the great opportunity. This is the, the great day of convocation and fellowship and of worship together. And so it's already separated in our hearts. It's already a sanctified day in our hearts. And we don't need to make a huge effort to make it holy. If the day of the Lord, no, let me put it right. If the Lord of the day is our delight, so will the day of the Lord be. If the Lord of the day is our delight, so will the day of the Lord be. It'll cost us nothing. It'll cost us nothing. There won't be a cost in it for you. And you will gain It'll be a delight. The third obligation contained in the fourth commandment is cessation from work. On it you shall not do any work. <coughs> and this reminds us uh, that the Sabbath is to be a blessing to us, to mankind, to human beings. And this is what I referred to earlier when I said that uh, God must have had something in mind for his creation when he ordained the Sabbath. That he was looking to, uh, to human welfare, if you like, and the welfare of the world in which we live. The Sabbath was indeed made for man, as well as made for the worship of God. So you've got this prohibition of work, and um, the purpose of it is twofold. The first is to keep the Sabbath holy, obviously. You can't do both things. And the second is that it constitutes God's ministry of mercy to us and through us to others. And that's why it's not just the head of the house who mustn't work, but he mustn't put his servants to work or his livestock stock to work um, besides. So the commandment is extensive in that sense. And... It's, it's a principle which seeks to promote the welfare of human society. And we'll return to these perhaps a bit later on in the series. So what's the rationale? You've got three obligations. What reason is offered in the commandment? Well, the reason offered in the commandment is what we've already seen. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So you see the pattern of scripture that we looked at in 1 Peter in the mornings. You've got imperatives. Three imperatives. If you like. Three imperatives. Three commands coming to us in the one commandment. And then you've got the indicators. Then you've got the great statements, the great reasons undergirding the, the command. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and so on. The Sabbath law is grounded in and based on the creation ordinance. We don't start with the fourth commandment. The fourth commandment doesn't start at Sinai. It goes back to creation. It goes back to God's decision. It goes back to God's action in blessing and sanctifying the seventh day. And, and really the logic of it is very simple and very compelling. 
God is requiring us to follow his example. It's as if God is saying, well, you be holy because I am holy. You rest because I rested. You keep this day holy because I keep it holy. It's as simple and as compelling as that. And so what the fourth commandment does is to turn example into obligation. And God is gracious in this respect because he doesn't leave us to scratch around hoping to find out what to do. He has given us the example and that's what he demands of us. That's the grace of God. God giving what he demands and then demanding what he's given. Not much guesswork involved here, is there? So what we say again, when we consider the significance of all this, is that the Sabbath is utterly fundamental to life in God's world. And when that Sabbath disappears from society, and when it disappears from the church, or when it's held up to question and controversy in the church, then that is the measure of God's disappearance. When the Sabbath goes, God goes. And the sign of a godless society is a society without a Sabbath. John Murray said the fourth commandment is an element of that basic law which was distinguished from all else in the Mosaic Revelation by being inscribed on two tablets of stone. The fourth commandment belongs to all that is distinctive and characteristic of that summary of human obligation set forth in the Ten Commandments. It's basic. It's, it's an element of that basic law. That's how basic it is. It goes right back to creation. And the fourth commandment is simply picking up that fact and turning it into obligation. Basic law. And if it's not, then God didn't establish it, and we're not under that kind of obligation. But because it's an ordinance, which has then been translated into a command, then it is supracultural. It's not time-bound. It's not historically conditioned. It's not culturally conditioned. It is an ordinance of creation, which has been turned into an obligation. Well, let me come very briefly then to my third and last point. Uh, what is the purpose of the commandment? And here we really have to perhaps go a bit outside of, of, of um, the, the Decalogue. It seems to me that one purpose is for us to do what God did, and that is to contemplate His glory. We set aside this day we remember the Sabbath, we keep it holy in order to contemplate His glory. Remember the psalmist said, the heavens declare the glory of God, the sky above His handiwork. Those are the things that God viewed when He finished His work of creation. And He rested from that in, in, in the sublime experience of viewing His own works. And so God calls us from the contemplation of earthbound things, of six day a week things, to the contemplation of himself. Now I'm not saying you shouldn't contemplate him on Tuesday. Of course you should, if you have the opportunity. But six days you shall labor and do all your work. And so you've got those things to do. But the seventh day, that's a day for contemplating God. So he calls us away from the busyness to the stillness, if you like, and the opportunity and the freedom to contemplate himself through the ministry of the word and sacraments as he sets Christ before us, who in fact is, is, is the summation of all that the, the Sabbath in its fullness actually means. So that that we see in Christ everything summed up. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all the fullness of the Godhead dwelt bodily. He who has seen, the far, has seen me has seen the Father. 
and so on and so forth. Everything is in Him. And so when we want to contemplate the works of God, right at the center of our contemplation is going to be Christ. And when we come into the house of God, He is the one we hear about. And the things that pertain to Him are the things we hear about. And so we, we satisfy our souls in contemplating Christ in all the glory of his person and work. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory. <coughs> the Sabbath calls us to do that. And that in, in that exercise, it's an exercise of faith because we believe now, don't we, that God has instituted this, this day for His glory, but for our enjoyment of Him, for our benefit. And, and so we come together on that day for that soul-refreshing view of Jesus and His Word. God was refreshed, and we are refreshed in the contemplation of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. So you see, the, the Sabbath is not just therapeutical, it's doxological. It's not just there to make us feel better, it can do that. But it's there to enable us to worship God, to focus on Him, to motivate our worship, to excite our spirit, to elevate our affection, to galvanize our will. In a holy determination to worship the Lord our God in the beauty of His holiness. And so the Sabbath really is a day of God-centeredness. And a day of God-centeredness is a day of God-centered worship. There is no other kind of worship actually. Any other kind of worship is not worship. If it's not God-centered. It's idolatry. So, we have this day for that purpose, to contemplate His glory, and then finally to refresh ourselves in that contemplation. There is a physical spin-off, obviously. Uh, we all need to rest. We all need to uh, charge our batteries, as it were. But the emphasis is on the spiritual, on the restoration, on the strengthening of the inner person by the Holy Spirit, on the spiritual refreshment of God's people. And the Sabbath is perfectly suited to that. Now I know um, uh, that some here tonight who've had to come from the workplace and so on, and that society has mangled it and made it very difficult for um, us to take the view of the Sabbath that maybe I'm putting forward. I'm stating, uh, if you like, the ideal. 